Well, good afternoon. Before we start, uh, just some housekeeping items. Uh, most of you here are with agency or in department. Uh, I don't have to tell you, but please note the exits and be aware that in case of an emergency, you need to just take one of them and proceed down the lobby and go out the building. Uh, the restrooms are on the uh, I Street side, on the south side of the building. And uh, especially for those that are uh, watching on the internet, um, on the Q&A, we really strongly encourage that if you send your questions in, to do it at your first opportunity so that we don't miss it uh, later on uh, during the uh, seminar. So uh, with that, Dr. Jarlene. Welcome everybody to today's technical seminar titled In Vehicle Air Exchange Rates Inside to Outside Ratio and Exposure to Traffic Related Particulate Air Pollutants, which will be presented by Dr. Scott Freen. I am Nargis Jareen, the contract manager for this contract. This study is part of research division's ongoing investigation of the adverse impact from traffic. In vehicle exposure to traffic related pollutants are frequently high due to proximity to relatively undiluted emission from other vehicles on the road and the typically rapid air exchange rate inside the vehicles. For example, ARB research staff have found that Californians only spend about 6% of their time in their vehicle per day, but receive about one third of their total PM2.5 exposure from their daily commute. Other studies, including one by ARB research staff, reported that concentration of ultrafine particle and volatile organic compounds are up to 10 times higher in vehicles than the ambient levels, and that ultrafine particle in vehicle concentration were higher on freeways with heavy track traffic. Therefore, it is apparent that in vehicle exposure can contribute a significant portion of a person's overall exposure to vehicle related pollutants such as PM2.5 ultrafine particle. So if we don't take this in vehicle exposure into account, this can result in significant exposure misclassification. Previous studies that have been done have tested a limited number of vehicles under fewer roadway conditions and over shorter time periods. So those studies could not be generalized to predict in vehicle exposure. The study that you are going to hear about today developed and validated in vehicle exposure model, which can be used as an important tool to estimate in vehicle exposure to study health impacts for current level of exposure and in the future as new control measures are implemented. Finally, uh, I would like to point out that because ARB understands the importance of this type of exposure, we are funding a study to investigate in cabin filtration technique as a possible cost effective mitigation measure to reduce in vehicle air pollution exposure. This study will assess the effectiveness of high efficiency filtration in passenger cars and school buses. The result of this filtration project will be available in March of 2014. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Fruin, who is the co-investigator of this study. Dr. Scott Fruin is an assistant professor in preventive medicine in the Division of Environmental Health of the USC Keck School of Medicine. Before moving to USC, Dr. Fruin was with the research division here at ARB, and he was instrumental in developing a unique research program to look at on-road and in-vehicle pollution. His current research focuses on air pollution exposure assessment and includes field measurements in support of population-based and longitudinal health studies. Please help me welcome Dr. Fruin, Dr. Fruin. Thank you for the thank you for the introduction, Shereen. Well, I think uh, I'm I'm really proud to present this work because this I think was a very successful contract 
and we made a number of important advances, not only in, in vehicle exposure assessment, but also on-road concentration prediction models. And perhaps uh, we've come up with a, a better way, or at least a more efficient way, to also do emission factors, which right now are very important to, to track, because so much is happening in the, in the diesel, heavy-duty diesel side. Uh, one reason for the success, I think, is we had an excellent team uh, I think some of the world's best experts in, in a lot of these areas. It was a collaboration, uh, collaboration of course, be, between USC, where I am, and uh, Costa Ciudas and, and his students on the other campus, as well as the University of California, Irvine, Ralph Delfino's group. And we also had uh, an Australian, Luke Nibbs, collaborate with us. So we, we can actually call this an international study, international collaboration. My talk is uh, it's, it's fairly long because I have a lot of results to present, but it's, it's split up into basically two, two areas. One is uh, the actual in-vehicle testing and in-vehicle concentrations. And a big part of that was air exchange rate. That's really the dominant factor when it comes to trying to estimate in-vehicle concentrations of particle-related traffic pollutants. So uh, it was a lot of work done there, a lot of advances made there. Then I'll talk about how we incorporated that into the inside-outside ratios. And a lot of emphasis there was with ultrafine particles, because I think that's where the exposure assessment is most in need of improving. And finally, I'll bring it all together using real-world simulations, real on-road measurements in, in Los Angeles, characteristics of the US fleet, put it all together, and then show you, in the end, in the real-world situation, what's most important. And it's interesting that the the uh, results balance out pretty nicely. Uh, second two parts will we'll deal with in the on-road measurements from the mobile platform. One is the other part of the equation, and that's what's happening on roads. So the first part is the inside-outside ratios, and that's the multiplier that we use to uh, multiply the on-road concentration. So those two factors are both needed to uh, estimate in-vehicle exposures. And then the last part will be the emission factor work we did. Uh, the good thing is both uh, part one and part two can, can be, uh, that work can be done with the same data. So there's uh, some real uh, possible efficiencies. So our goal for, for part one was we wanted to really finally characterize what determines in vehicle concentrations, particularly for ultrafine particles, and then develop predictive models. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Jareen mentioned, our motivation is we, we know that the in-vehicle route of exposure is important, and, and for a lot of traffic-related pollutants, it can easily be the, the majority exposure of your, of your daily exposure, depending on conditions. And on the health side, very little has been done, actually, to link health effects to ultrafine particles. So before that's going to happen, we need good exposure assessment, and that will definitely need good consideration of the in-vehicle exposures. So, Another aspect of, of this modeling that we wanted, we wanted this to be epi, what I call epi-friendly. And that is uh, predictive models that are usable in an epidemiological sense where you have cohorts of uh, hundreds, hundreds or thousands. This means that the information that you put into the model has to be easy to obtain. So things that you can get from things like questionnaires, things that are basic like how old is your car. And I think we accomplished this, we, um, as, as I'll show you in a bit. So our specific games first, uh, since we did know that the air exchange rate is so critical to this, to this equation, we wanted to finally sample a large representative sample of, of, of vehicles. No one had ever done this. The literature has isolated pockets of handfuls of vehicles. Sometimes it's not even clear how old they were. And they're not, they're not really usable data. So we said, you know, time to finally get to the bottom of this and see if, if something is as complicated as air exchange rate is predictable. And indeed it is. So we uh, sampled almost 60 cars at different speeds and, and ventilation settings to, to come up with these models. From that, uh, we were pretty confident that we could uh, add on, uh, build on that and develop predictive models also for the inside-outside ratios. And of course, the last part that's still underway is um, adding the other particular pollutants like d uh, black carbon, such as uh, a good surrogate for diesel PM and uh, larger sizes like PM 2.5 or particle bomb pHs. It looks like the relationships also are very good for, for those pollutants as well. So it'll be uh, very useful when that comes out. So a little bit of background. When, when we're talking about air exchange rate, that 
is the rate of air turnover inside your vehicle, and it's typically measured in air changes per hour. So you often see this with homes, and it's usually very low. It's often one or, or maybe two if your windows are closed. And in vehicles, it's very different. It can be low, but it, has a, it can be quite a range. It can easily be over 100 or 200 air changes per hour. Now, all the work I'm going to be discussing is with windows closed. If you have your windows open and you're moving very fast in a vehicle, your air exchange rate is so high that your inside-outside ratio is essentially one. You're essentially breathing on-road, whatever your on-road predictive models or your instruments are measuring. So we're only concerned for the case where windows are closed and you're getting some protection, some reduction in those outside concentrations. Um, as a, also a, a way to uh, give you a, a little bit more feel for the number, we do calculate or, or measure, say, if you're going 55 miles per hour and your windows are up and you have the ventilation set on recirculate, which is your lowest air, rate, lowest air exchange rate condition for ventilation choice, you're still getting 15 air changes per hour. So that's a, a pretty high rate. Um, the, the result of this big range of, of inside out or air exchange rate is that the inside outside ratios range from almost zero to almost one. So the range of possible protection based on the driving conditions and the vehicle uh, ranges from almost no protection to very, very uh, valuable and uh, almost complete protection for, for traffic related particulates. Now to determine air exchange rate in a better way, one of the problems that with the literature, uh, why it was so scanty, I think is because people assumed that they needed to use exotic tracer gases like sulfur hexafluoride, things that had really low or zero uh, ambient levels in the background. And that involves special instrumentation. You need a, a tank of that gas. And we thought uh, that there doesn't seem to be a reason why we can't use CO2. And instead of a tank of CO2, we just use persons a person's respiration rate and their metabolism as our source of CO2 because it should be fairly fairly steady. And that uh, turns out to be the case. And if, if that's the case, um, CO2 is very easy to measure. And even though the background levels are about 400 ppm, it's a very uh, simple and, and easy uh, uh, compound to measure instrumentation-wise. So we uh, started this out. In fact, my, my wife, LaRonda, was with me when we did the first feasibility test to see if while you're driving, the concentrations actually do uh, level out reasonably fast, depending on how fast you're going. If there's a, an equilibrium concentration that's uh, easy to obtain, that means that you can use that kind of information to, to determine air exchange rate. So our, our methods eventually ended up being uh, fairly simple. For each car, we would first park it and have two people in it. It would be stationary, windows up, no, no fan or anything, everything off. And we'd measure the rate of buildup of CO2. And this uh, next slide here gives a, a demonstration. So on the left part of the graph here, this is two people sitting in a car with the windows rolled up. And that's the buildup rate of CO2. You can start, you see it starts at a, a little bit above five, a little bit above 400. And the actual uh, source strength is the, the tangent of the of that uh, part of the curve there, right at time is, is zero. It's a little bit nonlinear because there, there, it's not strictly a zero air exchange si situation. Otherwise, we'd suffocate if we fell asleep in our car. But it's, it's pretty close to zero. And that's, uh, that gives a very repeatable source strength that's dependent on the two occupants and the size of the, the, interior, of the, the interior volume of the vehicle. Then the next part is, is driving at steady speed. So what happens is in this first um, uh, curve there, you see a, a slight decay to an equilibrium value of about 1,400 ppm. So it's plenty high to measure with precision. That was at, f at 55 miles per hour. And it takes about 20 minutes to reach that equilibrium level. And you can directly calculate that if you know the source strength from the, from the two occupants to be about 14, excuse me, 14 uh, air exchange rates per hour at 50 mi 55 miles per hour for that car. Next speed is 40 miles an hour, a little bit lower speed, a little bit lower air exchange rate. And you can see the next, the middle panel is about eight air changes per hour, and then about, uh, about six at 20, 20 miles per hour. So the, probably the most challenging thing here, this was all very repeatable when we did repeat tests. 
The challenging thing is if you, if you look at the, sp at the speed plot underneath the, the hash line, it's hard to find places in an urban area that you can drive steady speeds. So um, these involve, uh, say, for 20, 20 miles an hour, a lot of high-speed right turns. So um, <laughs> a, little, a little bit of driving talent there. But it turns out that's actually a pretty short fraction of the time, and, and we still reach, uh, appear to reach an equilibrium value that's, that's reliable. So here's the, the results. This is all 60 vehicles. And there's a lot of interesting information here. Uh, the first thing is, and the most important thing perhaps, is uh, what's labeled as RC and OA. So this is RC is in recirculation condition. This is the ventilation setting you, you pick when your fan is just only recirculating internal air. So that's uh, one of the two main choices. The other is outside air. If you have uh, mechanical pulling in of, of outside air, your exchange rate is, of course, going to be much higher. And the difference is so great that there's almost no overlap between the, the two settings. But within a, within a setting, if you are, say, opting for the most protection you, you can get from on-road ultrafines, and you set it to recirculate, um, you can see here that there's a, a pretty strong speed function. So the faster you go, the more you're building up a wake or a vacuum in your wake behind you and, and pressure differences around your car, that enhances the, the pulling of air into your car and the air exchange rate. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, though, is, is these uh, in the center, that's the range of car-to-car -car variability. So you can see for each car, there's, there's a fairly consistent increase with speed, but it's not as great as the car-to-car -car difference. And that's generally driven by car age or car mileage. So the older your car is, the more the seals have deteriorated, and the car just gets leakier. You can, al you can also somewhat notice this, that older cars are a little bit louder. They uh, allow a little bit more of the road noise in. That's the same kind of thing happening. Now, luckily, this is, uh, if, you, if you, rent, you can almost rank order these by, by age or mileage, which is, which is nice. When you get in the outside air condition, however, sp uh, speed matters some, but it, now it becomes a, a fan strength issue. And the car-to-car -car variability is less. And it's more what kind of energy is your fan using to, to pull in air. And in this case, we, we had a very simple measure for fan strength. We didn't want to get into measuring any air velocities or anything like that. So this is merely the ratio of the number of possible fan settings, um, the, the setting you select to the number of possible. So if you have, say, four settings available from low to high, and you set it on the first one, we call it 0.25. And that appeared to work pretty, pretty well. So to, to model this, we, we made separate models for these two different conditions because they were, they were so distinct and, and uh, probably different uh, physically. So we had separate models. We did a log transform because we had quite a range. Uh, and we used uh, generalized estimation models or GEE models to take into account that, as, as you saw in the previous graph, if you have a new car, it's generally always lower in air exchange rate. And it varies by speed. But there is some correlation within, within each car. So if it's tight, it's tight at any speed. If it's loose, it's loose. And that's uh, some, some correlation that violates the principles of independent samples. So we have to use a little bit special model there to take into kind of what's a repeated measures design. Um, the variables tested, as you see there, those are all things that we can determine pretty easily and, and say is uh, from, a, from the owner, things the owner would know, like the manufacturer. Interior volume you can look up if you get the make and model of the car. It's not something you'd ask someone, but it's easy, easy to obtain. Uh, things like frontal area, which might determine the vacuum that's created by the, the wake of the car. So just about everything we thought might affect air exchange rate. And then, of course, squared terms and interactions. And what did we come up with? Well, this, this is our, our two models. They were both uh, quite good at predicting the the results and, and accounting for the variability that we saw. On the left, for recirculating conditions, you can see the two axes there are the two most important variables, uh, speed on the y-axis, age on the x-axis, and air exchange rate is on the, on the z. And you can see that um, both of those variables are important, but there's also it's, there's a convex shape to that curve. So there's a, a, a speed-age interaction or if you're in an older car driving, driving faster, it's a multiplicative effect. And the air exchange rate uh, can be quite low, especially if you're a new car or at low speeds. 
but if you're in an older car at higher speeds, up to maybe about 30 air changes an hour, so very high. Now, for outside air conditions, the results almost start at that of, of where RC leaves off. So, uh, right here at the at the no fan and and zero speed, but uh, you you have to uh, it's point two. Sorry, you, you need some fan to uh, have outside air. But it starts at about 40 air changes per hour and works up from there, as high as uh, 150 for older older vehicles at highest fan setting. Now, the other thing is that there, there is a bit of a, a car size effect as far as interior volumes. So in both cases, there's, there's two surfaces there that cover the range from the smallest compact car to the largest car. And you get a little bit more protection in, in larger cars just because that bigger, uh, the bigger volume is, is slower to turn over. Uh, here's just a quick um, plot, a scatter plot of the measured versus modeled. Get an R squared of about about 0.7, and the residuals on the right look very very good. Um, this was the only other study that we could compare against that that had really usable air exchange rate data, which is Luke Nibs from Australia, and we did pretty well, um, uh, in fact quite well, I think, predicting his results, even though it was a different method. He did use the the uh, uh, more difficult sulfur, sulfur hexafluoride method, and it was a different country and higher speeds. So uh, that was also encouraging. Now to, met, to, to get into the inside and inside to outside ratios for ultrafines, we of course use uh, particle counters, but also scanning mo mobility particle sizes, because we wanted to look at the particle size effect. That might be worried that might be a uh, complicating factor. And we also did a big study. We, we made 260 measurements of those ratios at different speeds, again, steady speeds, and different fan settings. And we also added the data that were available from Luke Nibs. And this was the, some of the preliminary results we found. But we, we saw, that, like we suspected, that air exchange rate was really driving this relationship. And again, you see the, the big change in the, in the slopes there when you go from RC to, to outside air. But there was more we could do with this by, by adding in more detail to the models. And this is what we came up with, uh, again, incorporating all the variables that we think might be important. And again, we have two, two curves that are very distinct for recirculation and outside air. Uh, again, a, a similar shape, which is no surprise because it's so strongly driven by air exchange rate, but a little bit of, of uh, concave shape to the RC condition, a little convex to the OA. And again, um, if you look at these actual ratios, if, if you are in a uh, RC uh, condition and low speeds and a new car, you can see that that outside, inside to outside ratio is, is awfully close to zero. So you may be getting something like only a tenth of the concentration that you have on road. So that's quite a bit of protection. But as your car ages or you're going faster, you're getting pretty close to, to almost all the, uh, the same concentration coming in. You might have an inside outside ratio of 0.8. So you get a little bit of protection but not nearly as much as a, a newer car going at a, at a slower speed. Under the outside air conditions, of course, it's a lot higher. You, you start at about 0.5 and go up from there. Again, under some conditions, almost getting, the, reaching the point of, of no, no protection. So quite a range. So these are all conditions that uh, probably just the people in this room would they cover in their commute to work. Now, one good question is, OK, you, you've done all this for steady driving, which is not real. So what happens if you do real driving and you, you stop and go traffic or you're stopping at lights? So we were pretty careful to do some, some validation tests where we had real speeds. And we just used the average of the speed and the average inside or average outside concentration. And it was almost perfect agreement. So what happens is these relationships are all linear enough so that variations in, in speed and air exchange rate uh, basically even out. And you can use averages, which is uh, a, nice, a nice finding as far as uh, usability. Now, particle size was also a big worry, because as you know, if, if you're out on the roads, you hit plumes of fresh emissions. It's much, much smaller size. And if things, say the ratio was differing by size, this would make it also very complicated to estimate exposures. And we did have some, some luck here as far as the physical relationships go. And this uh, shows raw data. And the important thing to see here is if you, 
if you compare the a air exchange or uh, air exchange rate axis here, what's happening there as the air exchange rate changes and gets higher versus what happens on the y-axis here as the particle size goes from 25 to 400 nanometers, which is uh, well over the range of, of uh, uh, well higher, larger than the uh, size range of ultrafines, you see that the air exchange rate is much more a dominant uh, variable in predicting that ratio compared to particle size. And in fact, for most of the particles, it's a little noisy because we're splitting the data very finely here. But this, uh, it's, it's fairly flat across particle size and flat enough basically to ignore, especially when you consider that the real ultrafine number counts are so dominated by the smaller end. So that was um, a, a little bit lucky that it was that simple. Um, the other thing that we were really worried about was in-cabin filters. And a lot of people don't even know they have filters in their car, but they're about the quality of a home furnace filter. They're very coarse. Um, it, we were worried that people wouldn't know what condition they were in or when they were last changed. We were worried if they were loaded, they would change their efficiency. And they turned out to not matter at all. So we could take them in, out, you know, loaded, unloaded. They just don't matter for ultrafines. So not necessarily a big surprise if you ever see them, but um, it was a possible uh, complication to our model. So the, the good news then from the epi side is that um, to do this, what we think now is, is uh, good estimations of this inside-outside ratio. And if you have good on-road concentrations, you can do good exposure assessment with some very simple information that virtually every car owner would know. Things like the year and mileage of their car, we all know that, the make, uh, what kind of ventilation set setting do you usually select. Um, we, get, we need to think about that a little more. If peop some, some people think about that, some don't. But um, that's about the only, the only thing that might be uncertain. Um, open or close windows. But finally, uh, the last part is uh, time and destination of the commute, what roads you're on. I'll cover that in the next part, but that's largely something that can be derived from GPS, GPS data. So this is an attempt to now put it all together. So you see these ratios and, and air exchange rates, but it's still not completely clear what's, what's really the most important thing, although perhaps you might be thinking the ventilation choice, and you'd be right. But we wanted to put it all together with, with real data. So we took car characteristics from the US fleet, age and mileage distributions, and we added that with uh, real speed distributions for Los Angeles and came up with uh, basically cumulative distributions here for air exchange and, and inside outside ratio. And you can see there's big differences between the red and blue lines. That's your outside air recirculate choice. And within that, uh, freeway and arterial differences largely driven by average speed differences on those two types of roads. And when we finally add in the other factor that the ultrafine concentrations are much higher on freeways, uh, we get these, this split here. So this is the uh, expected cumulative distribution of real driving on LA freeway and arterial roads at real speeds with the real distribution of, of cars, car characteristics. So this is uh, probably a very accurate estimate of in-vehicle exposures in Los Angeles. And if you look at the differences there, I summarize these on the next slide, it, it's very neat that it, there's a, about a two to three range of exposure differences due to three things. One is the RC versus OA choice. One is, are you on a freeway or an arterial road? And that includes both speed and the concentration differences. And the last one is, how old is your car? And I arbitrarily used an interquartile range of, of about of, of what is actually seven years to just cover the bulk of the variability in cars. They all amount to about a two to three-fold difference in exposure. So it's, it's kind of neat that the, those, those major factors were all relatively equal in importance. Now, the interesting thing is if you have uh, a couple of those at, at a less protective setting, an older car using outside air, or even worse, open windows, and you're driving on freeways, uh, we, we can calculate that that kind of condition could give you something like three quarters of your daily exposure of ultrafine particles. So some people are highly exposed. People in a, in a, a newer car 
who have a primarily arterial road to route to work probably get very little of their daily exposure from their commute. So it's a, it's a big range. Now here's our, our current attempts. This is a little preliminary, but our attempts to extend this to, to other pollutants. So we have here uh, particle bound pHs or black carbon, are very similar. Uh, PM 2.5, PM 10, and, and ultrafine particles. And I wish I would have had this put in the order of the size, but if you, if you put it in that order, we see a little bit of a, uh, a shape like this from, from ultrafi ultrafines to accumulation mode to larger particles, kind of like the uh, inverse of the filter efficiency curves that you're all familiar with. So there is a little bit of a size effect, but you can see here that uh, as far as these inside-outside ratios, again, the, the dominant factor is that recirculation choice because of the huge difference in air exchange rates. And within that, the behavior of, of different particles is pretty similar. And I think we'll, we'll be able to model this with um, pretty, it, it, probably as good a result as ultrafine particles. And the results are fairly similar uh, between particles of different types. So part two, now this is the other part of the equation. You think that uh, hopefully now we can predict the inside-outside ratios pretty well. What do we multiply that, that ratio by? Well, you either have to go out and measure it or come up with another set of models. And we attempted that. And I think in this work, uh, there's some very interesting uh, comparisons on what is the most appropriate model to use and some interesting results. This, I think, was the first time these different models were compared. And the results were pretty different. So the study aims, uh, as you probably would expect, you know, we want predictive models using si similar variables, but very focused now on traffic conditions and meteorology and uh, whatever we think can help predict um, onward concentrations. It's been done by, by many groups to, to different degrees of success. And we uh, specifically chose a very, very large uh, portion of the Los Angeles Air Basin, in both Los Angeles and Orange County. We're also very careful to get a, a big range of grade because grade uh, plays a major role in emissions, especially for heavy duty trucks, really changes the, the power requirements. And we used our, our typical mobile platform suite of, of real time instruments, but in this case averaged to 60 seconds to from 10 seconds to remove a little bit of the serial correlation. This shows the routes if you know Los Angeles, but we um, uh, went very far east and, and north in this case compared to our usual routes. And the three types of models are first the, the, the workhorse model, of course, li multiple linear regression. But um, we thought that perhaps uh, a more generalizable model that can do uh, not take, take into account the nonlinearities is worth trying, um, the so-called uh, generalized additive models or GM models. And no, of those models with and without autocorrelation, there's almost always serial correlation in real-time data. And that's where adjacent concentrations are more related to each other than concentrations further apart in time. If you don't take that into account, somehow you're, you're vi again violating that assumption of independent samples. So it's uh, necessary to take that into account. Our covariates are about what you'd expect. Um, uh, time of day, very important different uh, aspects of speed and congestion, meteorology. Um, just for your reference, here's a few of the concentrations. Uh, I didn't mention that we were not out in the winter. We were just out from March through June, so we did miss the winter time. And that's probably why these concentrations might look a little low to you if you're used to looking at onward concentrations. But we are seeing, as I'll cover next, uh, big decreases in the, in the freeway concentrations and the, the heavy-duty con contribution. So here's a few of the, of the results just binned by either road type or time of day. These are two of the most important variables. On the left, you see the, the two green bars are arterial roads, and the two red bars are freeways. This, I think, is, is still driven, like always, is the, the big difference in, in truck traffic on freeways versus arterials. On the right, and I should say on the top, is particle bomb pHs on the bottom particle number, or ultrafines. Uh, on the right, the right two sets of, of bins are time of day. So you can see here the, the typical morning rush hour plus the, the more stagnant air leads to the highest concentrations. Uh, that's been observed in a lot of, a lot of studies as well. 
the interesting thing on this graph, similar kinds of graphs, except when you when you do look at PM 2.5, which is a more regional pollutant, indeed, you, do, you just don't see much of an on-road effect because uh, vehicles are, don't contribute uh, a large amount of PM 2.5 as, as a primary contribution to the, to the regional and secondary chemistry. So here's uh, a, a graph of, that shows you now how much, how much difference there is in the, in the different kinds of models. And the three, uh, the four areas that are highlighted, I'm going to show in the next slide that what that difference comes from. But you can see here that um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of variation there in, in how much each variable uh, predicted the measurement variance depending on the model and, and the variable. And I, uh, the AADT is average annual daily traffic count. So that's like a 24-hour average. So you can see there's a lot of variation there. But within the model type, the shifts were, were pretty consistent. And the performance of the, the nonlinear model was quite a bit better. And the reason that is, if you look here on these graphs, these are the, the four yellowed areas uh, of decent predictors. And you can see the difference between what a, what a linear model does compared to a, a nonlinear, um, non-parameterized uh, non um, uh, model. And especially when you have something like the um, time of day effect, which is in the top right, you have um, two, you, you definitely have a nonlinear situation where you have morning rush hour and, and, and stagnant conditions and, and concentrations going down, but then they come back up again because of the afternoon rush hour. So whether you take that into account in your model or not, it's quite important. Or another interesting example might be here, that, although that may look um, in that graph is fairly linear, but if you look at speed, um, emissions generally go up with speed because it's a higher power situation, but your inner vehicle spacing goes up too, which tends to bring it down. So there's two things combining there in a nonlinear way. So when you take some of these subtleties into account, the, the nonlinear models do a lot better. So here's just for your reference uh, some of the validation results of, of the model performance. And you can see again the, the, the nonlinear versus the linear model performance was quite a bit different, quite a bit better for nonlinear. Now um, here's my opinion of, of the weaknesses of the modeling. Uh, if, you, if you go back and you look at a, a plot like this, this reminds you just how variable the data are when you're measuring on, on roads. So you need, you need a very big data set. And I would say that was one of the weaknesses of, of this modeling was we didn't, I think the modeling was very, very well done, but the, the data going in could have been um, more complete. So one example of that is we weren't able to uh, group the data by hour because they're just, that was splitting it too finely. But of course, if as drivers, we all know that a lot happens in an hour on a freeway. The, the emissions can change a lot. The meteorology can change a lot. The speed can change. So we really want, we, we know that the, fin the finer we can split up that time variable, the better the models are going to be. Same with wind direction. We, we split that in only 90 degree sectors, which is very, very coarse. Uh, one really interesting uh, weakness here that, that happened was we didn't even end up including truck activity as a, as a significant variable. Previous work showed that truck fraction and, and truck quantities was pretty much the variable for on-road concentrations. In this case, uh, adding that arterial uh, as a variable of almost zero truck fraction ended up soaking up that variable and, and making it non-significant. So, that's another uh, thing that if we have better, and I think in this case more, more time-resolved truck information, we'd, the models would do much better. And lastly, our, our, our CPC, we had a lot of missing data during these runs. So uh, could have been better, but we, we did definitely learn a lot from uh, what's the best way to, and the most uh, sophisticated way to, to model these, these kinds of things. So. The conclusions of this, of course, we saw that time of day was, was very important. Traffic predictors, probably not quite as important as they should have been for some of the things I mentioned. Um, temperature was the big uh, predictor of the regional PM 2.5 pollutant. But the, using a nonlinear and, a, and a, a nonlinear model that takes serial correlation into account is really the way to go. It did much, much better performance. So that's where to uh, take that work from here. Part three. Um, finally, 
Um, we also explored using mobile platform data, the same data that we put into these models as a kind of emission factor calculation. And you've probably all seen emission factor results like the Caldecott Tunnel. They're really useful for, measure, for looking at historical trends and, and fleet emissions. And I think right now is a, a really fruitful time to keep an eye on things as frequently as possible because the, the heavy duty emissions are coming down so, so rapidly. And this is the new, the, new, uh, the new vehicle standards as well as at the ports, uh, additional uh, restrictions on what trucks can operate in and out of the ports, including some voluntary programs. Um, t high, the high emitting drayage trucks were specifically targeted. So I think it's really valuable to be out there as often as possible. Um, but how to do that, how to do that uh, in the best manner is, is uh, it's di difficult. I think our options are somewhat limited. Now, in the, in the course of looking at these trends, one thing that I was surprised to find um, is that the light duty fleet emissions are changing so much, even, even now. And, and it, even the LEV2 standards are making a, a big difference. So over the year 2000 to 2010, was, uh, I'll call them the 2000s, there's still big drops in light duty emissions. And I think that's what happened while we, by the time we were out with the mobile platform in 2003, and we saw that <laughs> trucks were just dominating everything on the freeways. It was about the only thing you needed to know to predict what was on-road concentrations in Los Angeles. That started to change, however, uh, probably around 2010, 2011, started dropping really rapidly. And the, it, the uh, light duty emissions, even though they dropped so much in, in the 2000s, again, are starting to become more important in, in a relative sense. So if you want to go out and, and, and measure these changes and, and see what's working most effectively, um, what are your options? Well, dynamometers are a tough way to go. They're really accurate. You can compare different drive cycles and, and, and do some excellent work. It's a, it's a tough and expensive way to get a representative sample, a large sample size. It's really hard to procure light or heavy duty diesel vehicles as well. Um, the tunnel studies up until very recently um, were limited by just getting a, a, a collective average kind of fleet emission. You didn't get individual, um, individual emission factors because it was mixed. And um, Rob Harley's group is starting to change that and uh, figure out ways to do that plume by plume. But it's, it's a, again, an expensive proposition. And for something like the Caldecott, there's a 4% grade there. So it's, a, it's not representative driving. And there's a big difference between driving up and down that slope. And finally, remote sensing. You can get, uh, I think, representative driving if you sample enough, uh, enough locations. But the bottom line that was cut off here is you can't do, you can't do particulate species. So, so none of these are really um, optimal, and, and they're all expensive. So we said, well, maybe there's a, a, an easier way to, to do this that's more efficient that does get representative sampling and also gets the full distribution of emission factors. So you can look at things like the, you know, are, are the high emitters disappearing faster than the overall distribution is changing or not. So we took a, a hybrid approach to analyzing our, our on-road mobile platform data. And instead of looking at individual plume impacts, so looking at the change in a pollutant versus a change in CO2, it's usually done. It's very labor intensive. I don't think anyone's come up with a way to automate that. We said, let's just do it by a longer interval and not worry about whether it's an individual plume or combined plumes, and just do it segment by segment. What happens then? And it turns out for uh, different reasons that you probably are also capturing the full spread of the emission factors. And why that is, I'm not really quite sure, but I think it's because the distribution is skewed enough that if you're on a freeway segment with a high emitter, that high emitter is so dominant that you end up with basically a high, emission, a high emitter emission factor for that particular run. And you don't have to go the bot to the bother of isolating that particular high emitter during that run. And this saves up your, this saves your analysis time by at least an order of magnitude. The other benefit is you don't censor any data, like uh, the individual plume studies where you don't have any plumes, you have multiple plumes. That data has to get thrown out. This allows you to keep everything in. 
And so you um, also benefit, I think, from a, a basically a larger sample size in the long run. So to do this, we first established the, the baseline. You, you have to um, take into account that the diesel and gasoline vehicles are so different. So we first established the light duty baseline by driving on the truck free portion of the 110. And did a, a bunch of those runs to get a, a, a distribution of emission factors for gasoline powered. Then assumed that that was operated as kind of a baseline on all the other freeways, and anything we saw above that was due to trucks. And again, it was, it's a measure of the pollutant change per CO2 above whatever the, the freeway baseline is. And we assumed the, the freeway baseline was the first percentile of all these distributions. And uh, that's an assumption that's fairly robust. It does, it's not really de strongly dependent on whether it's the second percentile or whatever you use. And then you combine it all in, in kind of a Monte Carlo approach, and you end up with um, distributions that compare very nicely to, to plume-specific studies. And again, like I mentioned, we, we're out, um, in this case, being very careful to capture the full range of congestion conditions, which is pretty much a time of day factor, but also grade. And here was a, a kind of a back of the envelope calculation I attempted to look at the cost. And if you, if you already have made the investment in a mobile platform, which is you know, 100, 100K maybe, maybe a little more depending on instrumentation, which the ARB has and USC has, and you're just, and you're just looking at operating costs, it's, it's about $1,000 a day in labor for, for two people to go out and sample for a day. Um, I had the ratio of uh, 5 to 10 hours per hour collected of, of data analysis, at least for this kind of analysis. And you, you try and make like a tunnel equivalent uh, analysis cost. I came up with something like 25K, which is probably less than a tenth of a typical tunnel study. So I think the potential here on, on using this approach, if, if, if we really come to think that this is working as well as it appears, it's a, it's a huge uh, savings in, in cost. And and probably quickness because of the reduced analysis time. So here's some uh, sample distributions of the emission factors. So you can see we got um, nice spreads. There's, there's actually very little we can compare against, although we did compare with, with uh, uh, Harley's latest results that they did plume by plumes or, or at an overpass, uh, Timothy Dahlman's paper, I think. And they compared very well as far as spread. So it looks like this, this easier approach does capture the high end um, surprisingly well. Uh, means, again, there's, it's, it's hard to compare means because there's so little out there that we think we would consider representative driving. So the Caldecott has a grade problem. The remote sensing, for, for whatever reason, they seem to always like on-ramps. So it's, again, it's a high power situation. It's, it's not, again, not representative driving. But when, when you, when we do find things that we think are representative, we, our central tendency and, and mean comparisons are pretty good. Um, so, so far I haven't shown anything with the 710. The 710 is, is also interesting because I think that's changed the fastest. And this shows some of the regulations that have been happening. Um, really ambitious uh, regulations to, to clean up the ports area and, and the 710 is a major corridor. And on these results we saw, um, again, more evidence that our measurement seems to be good if we can detect this kind of difference. So you see on the bottom right um, uh, the 710 versus the other freeways in terms of black carbon. And you can see that the, the 710 seems to have gotten even cleaner on, on a, on a, from a high emitter standpoint than other LA freeways, which means that something incredible is going on there as far as uh, getting the, the high end of that distribution off the, off the roads. I, I think. At least some of that's the drayage truck, because those, those trucks are so filthy. Um, just above that, nitric oxide, also almost like black carbon, um, the 710 is, is now cleaner for NO. And I, I always think of NO as like a really good primary truck emission. The NO to NOx ratio on freeways is, is often quite high. So that's another good marker that's come way down. But if you look at NOx, so the difference would be the NO2, not much not as big a difference. So that also seems to indicate that the control measures, probably the, the regenerating particle traps that produce a little bit of extra NO2 are producing enough 
um, to, to make the NOx um, improvements less than the NO improvements. I think that's a worthwhile trade-off, um, reducing diesel PM and black carbon for, for some NO2 uh, loss or maintaining the status quo. But anyway, we're, we're able to see um, differences like that. And the, the interesting thing is I think that we, you know, we, uh, we've always considered the 710 to be by far the, the, the most polluted freeway and the, by far the highest concentrations. And that may have changed. Um, another, this is another way to look at it on the top graph here. Now here we were trying to calculate total freeway emissions. And if you take into account the way at midday the speeds increase, increasing your vehicle miles traveled, and that's when the trucks come out. They like to uh, drive when the traffic is more free flowing. If you take that into account, you don't have a bimodal uh, emissions um, profile, a diurnal profile. You have, it's unimodal, and your peak is in midday. And if you take into, so taking into account vehicle miles traveled and lanes, you can compare the freeways with each other. And this top part that shows the, the 405 and the 710 are almost the same as far as NOx goes, which I would have never, never thought was, was possible. Um, the graph below also shows that now as the heavy-duty vehicles are getting clean enough, you can offset a um, doubling, or a, I'm, I'm sorry, you can offset cutting the vehicles in half if you double your vehicle miles traveled. So we're reaching the point again, even though uh, light-duty vehicles have gotten so clean that we may be losing some of the gains from the heavy-duty side just through sheer growth of vehicle miles traveled. So it's, it's an interesting thing that we should maybe uh, keep in mind that the, the freeway impacts are not necessarily quite as truck-driven as maybe we've been thinking. So in conclusions for part three, um, the HDD emission factors are definitely coming down extremely rapidly. The regulations are really working well. Um, and the mobile platform method of, of determining these seems to work strangely well and would be a, a probably a big cost and efficiency advantage over other types of, of methods. And of course, the 710, uh, what used to be you know, the granddaddy of, of dirty freeways, now seems to have caught up or even gotten cleaner in some ways as, as the other freeways in probably just, uh, I would say, two or three years, so very short time in regulatory terms. So to conclude all, th all three talks, um, the things I think are, are good to come away from this that I, that I want you to, to uh, stick in your mind. It looks like now we, we've finally reached a point where we can predict in vehicle in, uh, air exchange rates and inside outside ratios well enough that we can do really good uh, exposure estimation of, of in vehicle exposures as long as our on road models are, are up to snuff. And the on road models are reasonably good. I think there's some, I think we've reached a point now that that's probably where the resources and the energy should be focused on. And I didn't mention before, but if you, if you split up arterial and freeway predictive models, the, the freeway models are pretty good, the arterial models are not. I mean, they almost don't exist. And again, as highways get, uh, freeways get cleaner, that arterial component of exposure is probably gonna also become correspondingly more important. And finally, the last thing I think is encouraging for all of us, since we all have mobile platforms, the mobile platforms uh, potentially can serve double duty by helping inform these, these onward predictive models. The same data can also apparently be used to, for pretty good emission factor work and emission factor trend work. So that's quite a nice, a nice efficiency. So this is what I would recommend as, as next. I mentioned the arterial onward models. Uh, really in, in need of, of progress there. We, we do need to be a little bit careful about uh, making sure we're characterizing people's behavior inside vehicles so that the choice of ventilation setting is so key and I'm not sure you can trust people to, to know what they usually set or, or to even have thought about it. It's easy to determine you can use something like CO2 because the differences are so great. But we should do a little more work on that. And when, they, when do they have their windows open? Is there a, there's some evidence that there's a certain temperature range where people like to have the windows open. Um, that's, that's still pretty open. 
Um, the other relationships between other pollutants in that uh, inside outside of ratio, I think we're well on track there to having some, some good models for the other traffic related particulate pollutants. And finally, what we're trying to do at USC next is now that we feel that we can do good exposure assessment for in vehicles, is to set up a longitudinal commuter health study and actually see what these high exposures do to you day after day and year after year with health endpoints on the cardiovascular disease side. So that's something that if we can get funded, I think will be a, well, in, in my mind, it's even a, a little bit of a, a hopscotch over the difficulty of doing near road expo health studies because that exposure assessment is so difficult. If we can go hone right in on the commuting exposures, which I now think we can, we can model pretty well, we might be able to get at the, the root of the causal mechanisms and the components of the traffic-related pollutants are most concerned. And of course, that would make everyone's job a lot easier if we knew what it was about traffic that's so toxic. So to, to acknowledge some people a little more specifically, I uh, definitely want to uh, point out that Milakshi Huda just did a fantastic job on so much of this work, the measurements and the data processing and the analysis. Um, she's Kosas's student uh, during a lot of this time and now, now my postdoc. A wonderful job. Um, in our group also, Sandy Echo on some of the statistics. On the Irvine side, Jun Wu and, and Lian Fong Li, I did, think they did a great job on the onward models. And of course, the, our collaboration with Luke was, was very painless, and he was very helpful. And of course, the PIs were Ralph and Costas, which all know well. So I think this was a, a, a great team and, and a really productive, productive outcome. And in some areas, I think we're really, really and sorely in, in need of, of more attention like their exchange rate. So thank you so much for your attention. And we're happy. That's cool. So any, any questions? And I think we might have some internet questions. That was very interesting work, Scott. Um, I'm interested. The last thing you said was you'd be interested, you think a health study of health impacts on commuters would be interesting. How would you separate out the effects of exposure versus the stress associated with commute? Right. Um, I should mention, too, that th there are some good studies being done at, on the acute effects. So, so I was thinking more of chronic when I mentioned that. Uh, that's a, a really thorny issue. And that, that's when the first thing that comes up is how do we take stress into account? particularly when you consider that LA is also the most, has the most travel delays. It's rated at the top and, and travel delays and, and the unpredictability is really stressful. So we, we struggle with that. It's, it's not a, it's, it's an expensive thing to measure. So we consider things uh, like hair cortisol or something like that, like a stress hormone, but it's, it's expensive and we, we're, we're, we're struggling with that issue. So that there's also some, you can maybe get around it by, you know, good, good questionnaire type data, just self-reported stress, which is not, is never, it's never as good, but it's about 100 times cheaper. So it, it might be enough that we can correct for that as a confounder. But yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent question. Scott, very nice talk as we're used to hearing from you. Um, it, it seems like one major implication of your research is if you want to reduce your own exposure to um, freeway uh, pollution, that you should have your recirculation setting, you should keep your windows closed, you should have a newer car. But then that would increase the um, importance of indoor air pollutant, indoor generated air pollutants. So, you know, the uh, CO2 from your breathing can eventually lead to drowsiness if it's high enough. Um, I guess there's compounds that come off the seats and so forth. Is, um, is there any data on the relative disbenefit of reducing the air exchange rate by increasing um, indoor generated pollutants? Yeah, another really good question. I, I usually have a caveat in there about CO2 because uh, if it's high enough, it is, it, it is cap and some people especially capable of producing drowsiness, which is dwarfs this kind of risk, right? So um, the, the big issue, the, the, 
I think is if, if you're alone, you're usually okay, but if you have two or three passengers, your CO2 gets really high quickly if it's on recirculate. And if, if you're going to make this decision or, 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 you know, we make recommendations, um, we should probably point out that if you, if you have any passengers, you know, you should every few minutes just crack your window for a bit. And it, it clears the, the CO2 out very rapidly. And uh, I think it's probably even, well, it, that, that does the trick. And in fact, some, it, I think there were some cars that even had a, a CO2 and oxygen sensor where we couldn't keep it on recirculate too long. So, um, but that's, that's something that um, definitely should be a concern. There was, there was a recent study that just came out that noticed some, some deficits in, in neurological function as low as 2,000 ppm. And, you know, you hit that all the time if you have a passenger in your car, if, if it's recirculate. And th those are kind of subtle effects, but it, it shows that um, at, a, at a level that we often experience indoors, and including in, a, in a, a typical meeting room, you can hit 2,000, you know, a classroom. So it's, it's definitely a concern. And um, the other thing is the, uh, if the car is off-gassing off a new car, um, you, you, want, you probably want some air exchange rate. And we've also seen if, you, if, you, if your car is dirty, your, your seats can produce a lot of PM 2.5 and PM 10 in really high levels. So there's, there's some, some trade-offs. Is that? <laughs> Question? internet audience um, I think this is pretty much you have answered it was a question sorry um, what is the uncertainty of the co2 concentration measurements how big uncertainty does it cause in the year exchange rate so the the uncertainty in the co2 measure measurements was uh, well we were using a, a Q track and Q tracks are very good at they're very accurate at determining a, a change in CO2 if, and and to, to, act, to measure accurate levels of CO2, though, they have to be very carefully calibrated and they often drift. Now, in our case, um, almost everything we did was, was used in more of a ratio sense, so I think the uncertainty was pretty low. And we usually evaluated this by just repeated measures. So we would do things like the, um, do the same buildup test for the same occupants in the same car after the test. Um, we could even uh, basically see a difference after we had lunch. So your metabolism ups a little bit. So I, I think it was pretty sensitive. It seemed to be very repeatable. And mm -hmm. um, we, did, we did do a full-blown uh, kind of propagation of uncertainty. And I think the, the, the instruments you know, contributed, but they, they, they didn't dominate. And I can't remember if it was, there was something else that was also quite important. But the, the, you know, all the it was good in the sense that all our source of uncertainty were, you know, we're contributing fr from many sources. Not one single thing was dominating, and it certainly wasn't the CO2 measurement. And that's one of the advantages I think of measuring CO2 is there's plenty there, so you're not measuring a, a trace gas that's at really low you know, ppm levels or anything. Um, there's there's plenty there. So okay. thank you. It's a good question though. Okay. Um, time on your slide 32, time of day effect on the right, were they conducted on the same types of roadway, giving there was a clear effect of road type? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we, if we uh, segregated by road type on that plot. Um, I guess I can't answer that, but I, I suspect that you know we, that's it's that's such a consistent pattern we see. I don't think it matters strongly if you split it by road type or not or not. Okay, thank you. So we have quite a few. All right. Sure. On uh, slide 19, what kinds of cabin filters being tested? 
There is a ARB uh, project testing HIPAA filters for cabin air. The preliminary data showed good reduction in cabin particles. Current uh, commercial filters are probably of low efficiency. However, an Im important issue is the housing of cabin filters is usually poorly sealed, so air from outside could easily bypass cabin filters, which reduces the effectiveness of cabin filters. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if I can tell here whether the person's asking about um, built-in car uh, filters or um, separately, you can buy separate per separately purchased filters for your car. Um, so I'll, I'll just answer both. I think the, the important issue on the separate car filters is under high air exchange rate conditions, they have to filter a lot of air, and that's probably more important than their efficiency can probably assume that the efficiencies of these of these filters are probably okay and it's not going to matter very much whether it's 99 or 97 percent efficiency if the air exchange rate is completely overwhelming it and it's only filtering five percent of the air so so that would be the big issue and, and they're um, if they're powered by the cigarette lighter or the, or the phone charger I'd, I'd be surprised if they were moving a lot of air like they would have to under air, higher exchange rate conditions so if if it's if it's inside the car though you I mean you could conceivably replace the in cabin filter with something a lot more efficient the pressure drop would be higher but you could maybe pleat it and get a good surface area and you'd have to probably change it pretty often so you'd have to be a little bit more diligent um, that would you know that would work that would make a big difference if you if you actually add active filtration into the equation. Um, and then the, the, the person asks about the seal. Um, yeah, if it's poorly sealed and air can just run around it, it's going, it's going to. So it would be, you'd, you'd have to do a little bit of car engineering and a little bit more owner maintenance diligence to, to get that to work. But um, that might be a good approach to, to fixing your car's air quality, at least for particles. Yeah. Hi, Scott. Hi. Um, a comment and a question. You you alluded to this a moment ago that um, some of the manufacturers have vents that are designed now to open for a few minutes every so often. I think you said something about that in one of your responses. We had talked to GM probably five years ago now, and they acknowledged, one of their technical people, that in fact they had designed their vent to open like every 20 minutes because of the CO2. So I, I'm wondering if you... A fixed time interval? So it wasn't any sensor? Or um, at that time, I think he said it was at a fixed time interval. Okay. That's but simpler. Right. Well, I'm wondering, um, did you actually see this in your data? Did you see something that made you suspect it? Or are you aware of other vehicles that or manufacturers that are doing this? Rare. I don't recall. It, it may have only been one, one manufacturer and maybe even one, one model, but we... When we would set it on, on recirculate, and we always would hit, uh, it was almost always the same level of CO2, and it was pretty, it was like 2,500. It, it was high, but not really high. And then the outside air would kick on, and we said, what happened? And, and it would win our experiment. And so we kept on, you know, and over and over, and I said, this, is, this seems to be automated. And because it always seemed to hit the same level, I thought it might even be a CO2 sensor, although it might, it might mm -hmm. could be an oxygen sensor or something, too. But it would be, um, I mean, that it, it definitely would solve the problem, the worries of, of drowsiness and, and uh, you know, that issue. Because, I, it, I mean, you've got to be a little careful about people getting, t you know, too obsessed with one thing and putting themselves at risk for another, another reason. So right. So as long as you don't pull up behind a diesel vehicle that <laughs> suddenly suck it, in all sorts really, of weather. I mean, it's, it, yeah. it's, it's really far more important if you have passengers. If, if you're alone, you're, you're, you're pretty much okay unless your car is really new and really tight. Right. So. Okay, and then one question. You showed a slide with your predicted, I um, think they were ultra-fine levels in the car, a uh, number of curves in, I thought you said on freeways in L.A. It was a general, your predictive model. Um, yeah. But I, I was curious about that because the levels of UFP can vary quite a bit on the LA roadways, you know, 710 versus 405. 
depending. Was that a combination of freeways or one in particular that you were using for prediction? It was I a mean? combination of freeways. So okay. we, you know, we, we thought about that some, and it, you know, mm -hmm. this was before we knew the 710 was more like the others, okay. so we had to be careful about how much 710 we included. But we, we tried to have you know, pretty much all the freeways on the map that you saw there were included and then represented at times a day because those both matter a lot. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, on, on, on those type of curves, the, the tails are, you know, always a little bit uncertain, but. Right. Okay, thank you. That's it for the okay. internet questions? Yeah, I think so. All right, any other more questions? audience questions? Um, thank you, I, got, I must admit those were all excellent questions. So uh, uh, you were paying attention very well and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hi, Susan. Hi. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Well. Oh, pretty good. <laughs>